Amen. Hallelujah. You guys ready today? Yeah. Our beliefs are being challenged. What do we believe today? Do we really do we really worship a living God? Yeah. With the Lord, the minority is the majority. Strength is not in numbers. Strength is in the, the, the presence and the fellowship of the Lord. Amen. It's all you. Hey. You sure? Sounds like you got a word. I just want to walk in circles <laughs> and get anointed while you talk. <laughs> Good morning, guys. We love you all. We'll wait just a few more minutes. We got some people in the hallway. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's, okay. The Father's here. Bless you guys. Oh, man. I just feel excited, thankful that we get to gather. Despite what's going on, that we're, that we're together today. You guys, what a blessing it is to be able to get together. I feel like this morning, one of the first things that I heard was, all things will work out for the good of those who love the Lord. All things will work out. And I've been through so many different things in my life where I'm just like, I'm having to plan and having to do things and whatever. And I'm like, is it going to work out? Is it going to work out? I hope it does. And I, and I spend so much time stressing and worrying. But at the end of it, it all works out. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, Lord, you are so faithful. So I made the decision that I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just like, nope, I'm sticking to this promise. All things are going to work out for the good of those who love the Lord. And I just, I, I stayed to that. And so I heard that this morning as I woke up. I was like, wow. Thank you, Lord. And I opened up the Bible, and it flipped exactly to Romans 8. And I was like, oh, this is so awesome. I turn on my Bible app. And I don't know if you guys have the Bible app. A verse of the day. A verse of the day. And the verse came out of Romans 8. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this is so awesome. Went right to Romans 8, and I just started reading it, you guys. It is so good to get grounded in truth again. It's so good to come back to a foundation of God's word, because God's word does not lie. It is true, and not only that, it has a way of re refreshing and renewing your mind. You know, we're so many different things, and we see so many different things, but what does God's word say? How can we get back to a place of truth and say, okay, God, I'm going to put on the mind of Christ, I'm going to think your thoughts. I'm going to stay in a place of truth. I'm going to be grounded in your word. What does your word say today? So I purposely, I, I purposely don't do anything but go straight into the presence of God. I don't, I try not to get anything that would distract me or try to get me to think something. I just go immediately to the presence and I say, okay, Lord, what are you saying? And I want to read this to wash over you. I want this to just let it resonate in your spirit. I want it to really ground you right now. And from this place, I want us to worship. Sorry, Is it before, dying out? Yeah, before you okay. do that. Okay. I think I'm going in and out here. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. So I just want us to ground ourselves in this word. I'm going to also be teaching the youth from this word today. It's so good, you guys. Romans 8, it just gets better and better and better. It's like building. It's like a crescendo. <laughs> it just gets higher. And you're just like, whoa, this is so good. So guys, if you want to take out your Bibles and follow along with me, I'm going to read out of the NIV. And just just hit your heart, let it sink in your spirit, and let it just minister to you.
<laughs> Come on in, guys. Come on in. Come on in. The seats over here on the side if you guys need some seats. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's good. Yeah, we might need. No, we're no? we we'll got the kitchen table. Right here? Yeah, right here. The kitchen table. Come on in. Good morning, Savannah. Hi. Kitchen table last year. Alright, guys, let's let's hear this word. Alright, guys, we're gonna we're gonna start in Romans eight. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. I just want to pause there for a second. A couple months ago, I shared a word with you guys about a man, John G. Lake, where he had a powerful healing ministry, and there was a bubonic plague going on in Africa, and he was called from, um, from the United States to go to Africa and bury the dead. So what happened was the people were dying and they were left in their homes and they weren't able, the, the family of those people who died from the bubonic plague weren't able to go into the homes because then they would get infected. And so John G. Lake said, I'm going, I'm going. The spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. And so he was able to go into the homes. I think he had like another partner with him, a helper or whatever. And in, they grabbed the dead, the dead bodies, and they buried them. And he was saying he had to bury so many. Bodies. And at some point, he just started putting multiple bodies in into the burials because, you know, so many people were dying from the bubonic plague. But this is what he used as his shields. This is what he used as his protection. He said, "No, the spirit of life has set me free from the law and sin and death." So what they did was, he would go and he would grab a and the bubonic plague would be on his hand and then they and then they took a microscope and they put his hand under the microscope and then you would see it like shrivel up and die like it had no effect on it yeah it touched him but it wasn't able to penetrate or, or you know, kill him or infect him or anything like that it, it was this this is what he uses his immunity against any plague that would against, come against him so I was reminded of that as I was reading that this morning to just encourage you guys the spirit of life has said free from the law of sin and death. As a man thinks, so he is. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man <clears throat> to be a sin offering. And, he, and so he condemns sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what the nature desires, on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death. But the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the spirit. If the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in your body, is in you, your body is dead because of sin. Yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Amen. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, we have an obligation not to live to the sinful nature, to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear 
but you receive the spirit of sonship and whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. And when, we, when it says sons, it also means the daughters too. So we're all included in this, you guys. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. That is us, you guys. We have a conviction. We are convicted by our beliefs. We are convicted by our faith, you guys. We walk by faith and not by sight. And so us gathering today, you guys, is a proclamation that we are people of conviction. We are not going to back down. We are not going to be silent. We are going to raise up. We are going to gather together in this time, and we are going to stand strong together, united. We are the body of Christ. We will not be a slave to fear. We will not shrink back. You guys, this is a time to stand strong with the Lord, because he is with us. What does he say in Joshua several times? Be bold and courageous, for I will be with you. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I will be with you. I will be with you. So today, guys, when we worship, I want you to sing as loud as you can. I want everybody in heaven, on earth, and in the under earth to hear what we stand for, what we're all about at Zion Church. We will not back down. This is what we, what Jesus died for, for us to have this access, this worship, our voice, our amendment, our constitution, what we stand for, and we will not shrink back, you guys. So gather today with a thankful, grateful heart that we get to do this. And Zach and I are on the same page. We are not shutting our doors. We are going to stay open. We are going to be the body of Christ that God is calling us to be in this hour. We are going to move forward. Okay? So bless you guys. So Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God. Thank you for the church. Thank you for the beautiful bride of Christ. Thank you that we're not alone, that we all get to be together in unity and power and of a sound mind, Lord. Thank you for your presence that is with us. Thank you that the Spirit of God lives inside of us. And thank you, Father God, for this moment today, for all of us to just worship your mighty name, Lord, and give you glory. We are all safe. We are all protected. We are all guarded. We are all healthy. We are all strong, Lord, in you, because it is you and your spirit, Lord God, that keep us strong and alive in this hour. So thank you, Lord. We bless you. We're excited to celebrate you today, Lord. We're excited to worship your mighty name. We're excited to give you glory, Lord. What an honor it is to praise you in this hour, Lord God. Thank you that our, our weapon of warfare is our mouth. Our weapon of warfare is our worship. Our weapon of warfare is our praise and adoration to you, Jesus. So we come boldly to your throne, Lord God, today in humble adoration. We love you, Father. We love you, Jesus. And, and we just give you all the glory right now in your name, Jesus. Amen. Stand, stand with me, you guys. Let's worship.
Thank you. 
your praise. Let nothing interrupt your praise. Let nothing interrupt your worship. Let nothing distract you. Don't take your eyes off the king. Don't take your eyes off the prize. Worship 24-7. Worship any thought or precept or agenda or motive that comes from a place that's not worship. Do not follow it. Worship the Lord in His glory and habits His people. We're the temples of the living God. We worship Him. He descends on His people. We take up the armor of God in our worship. We're confident. We're bold as lions. The righteous are bold as lions. The righteous know how to praise. The righteous know how to worship. The righteous know how to live in times of trouble, in times of deceit, in times of famine, in times of confusion. The righteous know where the throne is. The righteous know where the throne is. Let nothing break up your praise. Let nothing distract your worship.
running not from fear, but from glory. Glory. Everything is under your feet, God. You're the King of Kings. My devotion, my praise, exclusively yours. exclusively captivated by Jesus. So exclusively captivated by the Lord. Blinded by the glory of the Lord so that we can see nothing else but His face and live from that place. Live by faith. Joshua and Caleb, if they had their eyes on the land, they wouldn't have been able to take it. They had to fix their gaze and elevate their gaze on the Lord at all times, the whole time taking the land. submit ourselves to him we trample over death we trample over anxiety we trample over fear yes. kingdom of God come yes. on earth as it is in heaven yes. there's no fear in heaven there's no darkness in heaven there's no coronavirus in heaven that's how we're supposed to pray as it is in heaven let it be here through the dominion of the church through your kids being your kids knowing who they are God, pour out the gift of hunger on the church today. Pour out the gift of desperation. Jesus, you said, blessed are those who are desperate and hungry, for theirs is the kingdom of God. We want the full release, the full manifestation of God's kingdom on the earth, but we need hunger. We need desperation. We need desperation, so God, erupt on us your hunger, your desperation, so that the depths of us can cry out to the depths of you. Oh 
Just keep singing it out. Come and sweep me away. Sweep me away. Sweep me away. Hallelujah. Sweep me. Oh. Sweep me away.
doesn't mean, Lord, take me out of the world. It doesn't mean take me out of the world. Oh, if he removes all the Christians from the world, what hope is there for the world? It means sweep us away, capture us, rapture us in your glory so that we can live on the earth by faith and not by sight. Sweep us away, Lord. Awaken our spirits. We're going to take communion today, and that's personally where all my hope is, guys, in communion. All my confidence is in this blood and body. All of it. All my chips are on the table. All my money's in the bag. It's all right here. I don't have any other alternatives or options. This is it. 100%. Not cold, not lukewarm. Hot. Hot. How much do we believe in the reality of this? I already know where you guys stand because you're here worshiping. Your confidence is in this. In the power of the blood of Jesus. I've been sick in my body and I've gone to take communion and I've been healed by communion. These cheap little cups that we order from some company whatsoever, the Lord anoints because it represents yes. His actual blood and body. Yes. Amen. This is our hope and confidence today, Lord. Yes. Take this in remembrance of me as often as you do. The Lord set no limits or parameters on how often to do this. He said, do it as much as you want, but do it in a heart of reverence. Do it in faith and believe. Don't, don't take this with doubt. Even now, I ask the Lord, Lord, rid me of all unbelief. Yes. Yes. Rid me of all unbelief. Anytime I've come to take this blood and body and disbelieved in what this represents, I'm sorry for grieving you, Lord. I come love to you. I believe in the power of your body. I believe in the power of your blood. Forgive us for any unbelief and doubt we've had in our lives. When we need help, where do we run? When we need help, where do we run to? This is where I've brought my shameful past. This is where I've brought my sin. This is where I've brought my mistakes, my failures as a man. I've brought it all to the communion table to receive forgiveness. This is where I bring my bodily weaknesses. I bring it to the table and I take communion. And I get refreshed by the strength of the Lord. I pray today as we take this, Lord, your glory rests on each family represented here and the families that aren't here this weekend that call this their home. Refresh us today. Be a shield around us today. There's a pastor who was once approached by someone in the church and, and they said, hey, you got your armor on today? And the pastor responded to the guy. He said, I never took it off. Don't take your armor off at night. Don't ever lose your hope and your faith and your confidence in this. This is what we need to be clothed in today, church. This is what we need, the armor of God, the sword, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. This is the armor of God. I'm going to start passing this around. There's a hunger, a thirst. Thank you, bro. I'm just letting you guys know. This is where all my confidence is right here. Some people call it foolishness, but I look at it differently. The Lord deserves our full attention. He, de he deserves our faith. Families, be blessed today. Be blessed. Be encouraged. If you, if you have sin in your life today, guys, confess it to the Lord. If there's something in your life that's grieving the Holy Spirit, confess it to Him and receive forgiveness. He's a God of forgiveness. He honors repentance. He honors repentance. If there's something in your life you feel dirty by, He will clean you today. He will clean you today. He will clean you today. Man, it heats up in here. You guys are a hot church. It heats up in here when you guys show up. I... I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand right here. There we go. Uh, no, 
honestly, Lord Jesus, we this is where our hope is. This is where our hope is. Our hope is in a king who has a dominion that transcends all other dominions. Amen. Yes, we love our government. Yes, we pray for our leaders. Yes, we love medical professionals and medicine and, and professional modes of helping people in the natural. But when all that stuff breaks down, we have a higher king that we have to go to. And his dominion has to reign over all other dominions. I read stories of a lot of healings that take place in third world countries because they don't have the other options. Yeah. Someone gets hurt, they don't have medicine, they don't have an ER, so all they can do is right there in the ground, right there in the dirt, in their hut, they say, Lord, have mercy on me and heal me. And he knows he's their only option, so he heals them. Maybe some of us need to eliminate some of our options and exclusively give ourselves to the Lord again, and then we'll see our breakthrough. Maybe. Maybe. Not that for everybody. For myself, it's been a battle with migraines and these epileptic things I've had since I was a kid. And I've battled, Lord, when I have these, I go to these migraine pills and this medicine, and I want to stop doing that. That medicine's not my savior. I don't just want a temporary relief from this stuff. I want to be healed and set free from it. And for years, as a spirit-filled Christian, I wasn't healed. And it was a battle because I felt like I wasn't filled with the spirit if I was still struggling with sickness. And that's a lie. Mature, spirit-filled Christians can be sick and struggle with infirmity. It's nothing on you. I don't have a full answer for why that happens, but all I can say is what I've experienced. And there was times I put that medicine away and I suffered through it for two to four days or whatever, however long the episodes last, and I just say, oh, God, I'm worshiping you. I'm not going to the medicine cabinet. And then times I just threw all the medicine away. I said, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I usually have those every month. We had a men's group back in early May. You guys remember praying for me? It just dawned on me. I forgot about them. I usually write them in my journal when I have them and what I ate or what triggered them. And I went back in my journal and it said May 3rd or something. Men, the, uh, men prayed for me. I haven't had those since that date. Amen. Hallelujah. And they're totally gone. They're totally gone. So I just... If you're taking medicine, now, for some infirmity, don't feel bad, don't feel guilty. But I just pray the Lord speaks to you in that place and reminds you that He Himself can set you free. He can heal you. And I know there's pain. I know medicine helps. I know it. But I'm just telling you, there isn't always an alternative, and the Lord can heal and deliver. So as we take this today, there's deliverance from sin. The Bible says, by His stripes you're healed. The suffering that He went through healed your body. You read in Colossians, it says He suffered in his body as a man he brought redemption as a man you guys as a man as a man he suffered as a man he lived a sinless perfect life as a man in the flesh yes he was god but he didn't tap into his divinity to claim the victory it says it in, in uh, philippians chapter 2 he humbled himself he gave up all his divine qualities he surrendered it all and became lower than anything else on the earth he did this as a man as a man, he cannot liberate man unless he becomes one. So his body has power. Just be reminded of the power of his body. Yes, God is powerful, but Jesus as a man was powerful. And he has a body today. He's seated at the right hand of God in a body. And our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I pray over you as you take this with your families. Be cleansed by the blood. Be healed by the blood. Be renewed and refreshed by the body of Jesus. This is a reality. This is not fake. This is not tradition or something we do in church. This is real. We are partaking of the living God. This is real. This is more real than any drug you can do, any substance you can go get. This communion will provide for you the euphoria and the faith and the climax in life that you need. Right here. It's right here. It's all here. So be blessed. Go ahead and receive this in Jesus' name.
by the blood of the Lamb. Bless you today. Bless you today. I encourage you guys at home, take communion in the morning with your time with God. Get some bread, get some crackers, get something. Pray and take communion every day. Every day. Take it every day. cross is all lion. All lion. And yeah, we're called sheep, but we follow a lion. And he is roaring today. He's roaring. And the church just has to get low and hear him and see what he's doing and live from that confidence, live from that place of boldness. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The, the way the church ought to be acting in this culture is the same way they acted in the book of Acts. It's the same way the Israelites took the promised land. The people of God should never change like shifting shadows based on culture. God doesn't change. We're going to sing one more song about the Lord sending us out, empowering us. I pray during this season we'll see salvation. Amen. Maybe the Lord wants me to drop this thing. Huh? <laughs> Lord keeps telling me that. Put your guitar away. Um, I pray during the season we see salvations. Amen. Amen. Yes. The time is ripe. People yes. are fed up. People are frustrated. People are scared. People are... They're not finding hope anywhere. They don't know where to look. Yes. All right? And guess what? A little Christian comes along and says, Hey, can I share some good news with you? Amen. One of two things is going to happen. You're going to get rejected or they're going to listen and get saved. Amen. Who cares about rejection? Jesus says, By following me genuinely, you will be persecuted. You know, sometimes we need to go out and share the gospel just to get persecuted, to remind ourselves we're in the faith. Yes. Yes. And let the Holy Spirit be the one who convicts of sin and deliver people and bring people to their, to their knees to get saved. So we're going to sing this song about going out. I pray today you be empowered in this season by the Holy Spirit. Thank you. 
compassion for the lost, love that sends you to the cross. We receive it. We receive it. Jesus, you are worth it all. No matter what the cost, we believe it. We believe it. Holy Spirit, move in our hearts and us with power. pray for our children. If you guys want to come forward, we want to bless you guys. We want to cover you in the blood of Jesus. We're going to release the goodness of God over you guys. Come forward, guys. Come, come on, guys. Come on. There is power in laying on of hands. I believe in the invitation of the Spirit. When we lay hands on you guys, God is imparting something through us to you guys that you need next generation come on come on hey all I right cheer for our kids because living, yes our kids living in this world today yes their attitudes the good attitudes coming to show up and worship and being yes in the oh job. come on you thank you G you. thank you so much. you guys we're so proud of you we're so we're proud of you here. we're so proud of you you're so awesome you guys are amazing Amazing. You guys are brave. You guys are courageous. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these children, Lord. Thank you for every one of them, Lord. Wherever they're at, Lord, you see them. You see every detail of their life, God. Everything that they're going through, everything that they're feeling, Lord, you're in the details of every one of their lives, Lord. Every one of their hairs on their head is numbered. You know them, Lord, so intricately know them, God. I thank you for each and every one of them, Lord. 
I bless them today. I declare over them, Lord, your goodness and unfailing love. You will pursue them all the days of their lives, Lord God. And you will make sure, Lord, you are faithful, Lord. You will make sure that they will walk with you all the days of their lives. I declare it over them in Jesus' name. And I declare over them right now, Lord, your protection from the enemy, from the evil one, from any sickness, from any infirmities, from any temptations, from anything that would distract them from the calling that you have on their lives, Lord. I bless them today, Lord, to know you, to hear your voice, eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, Lord, to them. Give them dreams and visions in the night, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, and come against any confusion in their lives, any fear. I just declare that gone in Jesus' name. And I just release a sound mind over these children, a sound mind. No fear, even in the night, Lord God, as they get ready for bed, Lord, that they would sleep in confidence, that they would sleep in hope, that they would rest in peace every night, every night, Lord, with you. And God, I pray, Lord God, that you would reveal yourself to them. Grant them the revelation of Jesus Christ to know you better, Lord, to know you, to know you, Lord, to choose you. My prayer for these kids today, Lord God, is that they would love you with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their mind, with all of their strength, and that they would love their neighbor as themselves. And so I just declare this over them, and I bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you, Claire. Bless you, sweetheart. Bless you, sweetheart. Bless you, Josh. Bless you, sweet baby Elizabeth. Bless you, Abby. Bless you, honey. Bless you, guys. Are you guys happy? Yeah. I've learned that if you're not happy, you're a bullseye for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's a happy person. It's, it's like with your kids. One of your kids is in a bad mood. Who gets all the attention? You're like, okay, what's going on with so-and-so? Let's go have a talk. Let's pray for her. Let's make sure she's all right. I mean, it's exactly how it works. You can't, don't come in here with a bad mood just to get attention from the Lord because you'll steal it all, okay? But all I'm saying is you won't stay in a bad mood for long in the house of God because He's happy. He's happy. I'm happy to be here. <clears throat> uh, the only announcement I have is that Jesus is alive and he hasn't changed his game plan or his strategy. He still is releasing his power and his glory through willing vessels to change the earth. That's his strategy. We're looking to God. What's the plan? What's going on, Lord? And he's looking at us saying, you're it. Tag. I did my job on the cross, filled the church with glory on the day of Pentecost and said, go. You're it. You're my answer. You're my game plan. Does that mean we got to do huge stuff and change the whole nation and go to the White House and pray on the lawn, all this stuff? No, it just means right where you're at, be effective right where you're at. Be an authentic child of God right where you're at. It starts in your home with your spouses, your children, and then it goes out from there. The home, when the home is blessed and you know who you are in your home, it'll just go out from there. And the Lord's saying, you guys are it. You're my plan. Stay submitted to me. That's the only announcement I have. Um, we're going to be in part two of Psalm 23. My good shepherd. How is the Lord leading his people in this time? And I'm not, I'm not going to get into a bunch of cultural, political specifics. I'm just going to preach the word. All right. I'm just going to preach the word. We just need to know what this psalm says in all seasons of life, in every culture, in every generation. This psalm is still the same, and its truths are self-evident and consistent. It's amazing. No matter what changes on the earth, no matter what the world goes through, no matter what you're going through, personally, you can come to the Word of God, and it's an unchanging foundation for you to take Hope from, love from, faith from. You have all you need in the Word of God. Literally, the Word of God is all you need with the Spirit helping you to interpret, instructing you, teaching you. It's awesome. It is awesome. I'm so glad this book doesn't change. I'm so glad there's not a part two or different editions because we wouldn't know 
any absolutes. This word doesn't change. It's absolute all the time, and that's exactly what we need. So we're going to read Psalm 23. I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation, the whole thing. And today we're only going to focus on three components of verse 3. That's it. Three components of verse 3. The Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. I always have more than enough. We talked about this last week, having abundance in Him. He offers a resting place for me in His luxurious love. His tracks take me to an oasis of peace, the quiet brooks of bliss. Verse 3, and that's where He restores and revives my life. He opens before me the pathways to God's pleasure, and He leads me along in His footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to His name. Verse 4, Lord, even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness, fear will not conquer me, for you already have. And we're going to touch on this next week, that the only way to be truly free from fear is to be conquered by Him. To fear the Lord, to reverence the Lord. If you properly fear God, no other fear will overcome you. You remain close to me and lead me through it all the way. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I'll never be lonely for you are near. Verse 5. You become my delicious feast even when my enemies dare to fight. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink of you until my heart overflows. Verse 6. So why would I fear the future? For your goodness and love pursue me all the days of my life. Then afterward, when my life is through, I'll return to your goodness. I'll, I'll return to your glorious presence and be with you forever. Amen. Holy Spirit, teach us today. Instruct us. We need you and we're not ashamed of that. It's okay to say we don't know what we're doing sometimes. Holy Spirit, we need you to come and lead us and guide us. Comfort us, rebuke us, instruct us, empower us. Minister to us today, Holy Spirit. Even if what I've prepared today is not in accordance with what you want to say, then shut me down, Holy Spirit, and do, what else, do something else you want to do. But I give this time to you. I give these words to you. May they be glorifying and honoring to you. May we all be encouraged today and strengthened by the Spirit of the living God because we need power. We need power. We need strength and comfort by your word to be who we're supposed to be. Teach us today just the, the truths out of one verse in one psalm in the entire word of God. We just want to learn. Have your way, Holy Spirit. And I pray that at the end of this, Christ would be glorified, Christ would be magnified and more exalted in our lives. And if there's anything in our lives not bringing glory to Jesus, shut it down in us, Holy Spirit. We are willing and yielded to you to say, come and minister to us, come and work on us, come and do surgery on our hearts, come and breathe on us fresh wind and fire. We pray for a fresh baptism of your glory to be immersed in the love of God and reminded of who you are, reminded of who we are, and to live from that place of confidence, to live from that place. Jesus, we love you. We love you. There's no better time to be a lover of Jesus than right now. We love you, Jesus. And we pray for our world. We pray for our country. We pray for the values of the Bible to outlast all other things, all conflict, all hopelessness, all fear. And I pray that the values of the Word of God would be promoted in our midst. And wherever we go, that we would walk in love, not in judgment, not in gossip, not in backbiting, not in slandering, even when we disagree with views. We're not going to slander. We're not going to uh, gossip and backbite. We're going to honor you and love people into the kingdom. Have your way in our midst today. I ask in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I want that fan on, but it's too loud.
This is my prayer closet music that you're hearing behind me. I like to bring my prayer closet wherever I go. How you guys doing? Just waiting on the Lord for a moment. I love sermons. I love sermons. A sermon is a beautiful thing. It's an exposition on the Word of God. It's a proclamation of the Gospel going out into the hearts of people so that people can be transformed. A sermon has power. The Lord works with sermons. So if ever I'm just pacing or waiting, I'm just checking in with God. Sometimes we just we need His presence and we need a touch more than we need a word. But I'll just stay flexible with that. We love you. It's so good to be here with you guys, loving on God. There's nothing else I want to be doing. There's nowhere else I want to be. I'm serious. It's right here. All we need is right here. All we need is right here. It's amazing. It's so good. It's so good. Lord, I just want to give you a little bit of space. If anybody has a word of knowledge or prophecy, I want to give a little room for that. Mm. I just love how he says, that's where he restores and revives my life. So to me, it just says, Bob, if you want your life to be restored and revived every day with your Holy Spirit... It's just like you said, we have to pay for the oil. And yeah. paying for the oil is being in a place with Jesus by ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Not everybody has to agree with me. This is my perspective. But you don't need to make more time to get informed. You need to make more time for your prayer closet and get empowered by your relationship with Jesus. Because you can walk into a situation fully informed and prepared and lack the presence of God, and what are you going to do? And you can walk into a situation not informed and actually have more faith and confidence for what the situation needs. We need fellowship with God. Fellowship with God is going to change the face of this earth. We know how it ends. We know stuff is going to get worse. But the Word of God also says the church will become stronger and sharpened through the trials and will be all that she needs to be through her fellowship. Jesus knew this in the book of Revelation. He spoke to the church in Ephesus, and He knew they were going through hard times and they were going to go through harder times. And what did He tell them? Get back to your first love. That's where you're going to find all that you need. That's where you're going to find your strength. But we're going to focus on verse 3 today. If you could bring that up, Eric. Just verse 3. I tried to get further than this, I promise. I tried to get into the rest of the verses. I tried to just make this a two-part. I got into verse 3 and I got stuck. It's like I don't have four-wheel drive in the Word of God or something. It's like I'm, I'm spinning my wheels and going nowhere. and You know, I just get stuck. So we're in verse 3 all day long. Three things out of verse 3. Number one is He restores my soul. He revives my life. He revives my soul. This is, this is the word restore and carries the idea of turning back and reestablishing. I look throughout scripture and a lot of times this word is used and it says turning back. He brought back. He reconciled. He restored. An example of this is in Zechariah 10.6. I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph and I will bring them back because I have compassion on them. And they shall be as though I had never rejected them. Another example is Joel 2.25. I will restore to you the years the swarming locust has eaten. Anybody in this room who struggles with regret, God has a way of restoring time that you've lost. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. He can make things happen in a moment of time that got messed up over years that fix 
and retranslate and reinterpret everything that went wrong over the course of years. And it was like in one moment it got restored. Amen. It's amazing. It's amazing. I'll restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. I hear this word from time to time in the remodeling industry, and I don't always like it when someone asks me, can you restore this? Because I like the new construction stuff. I like starting from scratch. I like having a new surface, a blank page. You know what I mean? And then we get caught up in the north end, and I just can't get out of the north end of Boise. And the danger in getting into the north end is you pull up in your truck with your logo, and you put your sign in the yard, and you work there for one week. And everybody walks at night and sees it and calls you and says, can you come do this? Can you come deal with my mold, my lead? Can you come redo my bathroom? And seriously, we got stuck in the north end for two and a half years once and couldn't get out of it. You know, I guess it's my fault because I kept saying yes to the work. But I learned something in the North End that the age of that neighborhood has contributed to people wanting to restore and preserve and not just build new. You know, there's room out here in Meridian and we're losing room actually. We're going out to CUNA and Caldwell and you know, and there's, there's room to build new but in the North End there's no room so you have to restore what you have or make use of it somehow within the parameters that the city gives you and setbacks and all that. But I know that when someone wants something restored, it's usually a piece of wood underneath the surface that's been painted or damaged or weathered or corroded. And I'm usually asking myself, why do you want to restore that when we can go to BMC West and get you a brand new piece that looks just the same and make it look traditional. It's a traditional piece of oak or hemlock or something like that. And I find out these people want that piece restored because it's original to the home, right? They don't just want to tear it out and put a new piece in because that piece wasn't there at the beginning. It doesn't have a story to it. It doesn't have the years to it. It doesn't, you know, I get where they're coming from, even though me, I have no problem putting something new in a house because I can make it look just like something that was restored and none of you will know if it was original or not. But what I found out in construction is that restoration happens when something has value to the eye of the customer. And they don't just want something new. Even if they have the money to get something new, they'd rather spend a little more money putting forth the sweat and the hard work to get that thing restored because they see value in it. And as a contractor, my goal is to honor the customer. And if they want something restored, I'm going to restore it for them, and that's how I get paid. I'm not going to complain about how I get paid. I'm going to serve them and work for them. But the purpose of restoration is getting back to the original beauty of the material. And this is what God does in friendships to the ob in friendship to the objects of his affection. As you are in friendship with God, God cares enough to restore you, reestablish you, bring you back because he cares about the original that was lost in the garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were were in their original state and ever since that day they've gotten corroded. Mankind has gotten weathered down rotten, covered up with layers upon layers of the world, and God from the beginning has been trying to bring back his people, restore his people to their original intent. I looked up this word in the Hebrew, and sometimes I look forward to the fact that there's not a lot of other references for a word because it makes it easier to study. So when I look up a Hebrew word, if there's only two other places, it gives me more of an exclusive definition of what the word means, okay? And I don't have to spend too much time doing a word study on it. I looked up this word for restoration, and it was all over the New Testament. And I'm like, oh boy, I only have two hours. I can't get through all these words, but I just looked up, you know, five to seven of these words, and they all had to do with turning back, turning back to the original state, restoring, restoring, restoring. It's amazing how long the Lord continues to see value in an existing object. This is cool. Sometimes we think we're beyond repair. We messed up way too bad. I, I've, I, I had this thought just yesterday. It, was, it overwhelmed me. I thought of all the bad things I'd done in my past. And I was overwhelmed. Just for a moment, I was overwhelmed like again with all the sin and selfishness and narcissism and pride. And I just felt terrible. I'm like, Lord, oh my gosh. And the Lord really quick reminded me, don't apologize for that anymore. I already took care of that. This is just your flesh trying to overwhelm you to get you in guilt again. And it, I realized all the layers I had upon me that the Lord still persevered with me and made an attempt to restore me to my original in, uh, purpose and function and that he didn't give up. And if he didn't give up on me, he's not giving up on you guys. He's just... All through the Old Testament, God continually turned, tried to turn the hearts of his people back, tried to restore them. And then we get to Colossians 1, verses 19 through 20, okay? 
Now, if you have, I don't have the Passion Translation up here with me. I have my ESV. But please, if you have the Passion Translation, read these two verses out loud in the Passion Translation because this is the culmination. This is the best example of God reconciling and restoring. This is exactly what it looks like. Colossians 1. Brittany, you're going to get it. Verses 19 through 20. For God is satisfied to have all his fullness dwelling in Christ, and by the blood of his cross everything in heaven and earth is brought back to himself, back to its original intent, restored to innocence again. Did you hear that? In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell so that he could restore everything back to original innocence. That blows my mind. I look at Jesus as the dominant power tool in the game. I have my favorite tools. I like Bosch. I think Bosch made by the Germans are the best tools and they don't break down on me. I wish they were American, but they're not. They're German. And I have a lot of tools for the job. And in restoring things, there's a chisel, there's a sander, there's a planer, there's a skill saw, there's a paint chipper, you know, all these different things. But in the kingdom, there's one power tool. It's Jesus' blood. Yeah. One thing. And the fullness of God dwelt in Jesus. The fullness of God didn't have to do, dwell in different things. It was all in Jesus. God put all his chips in Jesus and said, in him is everything I need to get the job done and restore people completely in Jesus, exclusively him. This is why when you go out in the world and you deal with people who think there's multiple ways to become who they were created to be, you got to tell them there's not. It, Jesus is the exclusive way. If you're not in Jesus, you're not getting restored to originality and innocence. The church has to preach the exclusive gospel of Jesus being the way, the truth, and life. He's the only game plan. He's the only tool that can do it. It's his blood. God sees value in the original. This is why he looks at us like clay, and he's a potter with clay. He doesn't just get new clay. He works and he molds with the one that he's got, and if it's already been fired and dried, then he breaks it. And he reworks that same material. In life, you don't get a new canvas. Here's what some people think as a Christian. You get a brand new canvas. Your past is gone and taken care of. It is. You're forgiven. But you don't get a new canvas. Your past is your past. It contributed something to your life. But what I found out is what you do get is a new color on the canvas. You get the blood of Jesus. And God begins using the blood of Jesus and painting and reorchestrating and revising your life and reinterpreting your life through his blood, through his power. We get the world put on us. We lose focus. We get lost in all that's going on. And the original kind of disappears. And we really don't know who we are. And then we find out all it takes is just a little bit of time in the presence of God. And he restores. There's a little whisper. There's a little reminder. This is who you are. This is who you are. I take my fear into the prayer closet. I take... Sometimes I'll get on Facebook and just, you know, we have our church page up there and um, I just check and see if anybody messaged. I found a message by you like months after because yeah. I didn't check my Facebook. And I find out it's you and this woman we never responded to. And thankfully you came, you know, and didn't think, oh, these people don't respond on their church page. But I go on Facebook and listen, there's, you can immerse yourself in Facebook and lose your originality and your innocence because you'll get... This video put on you, this ad put on you, this thought put on you, this is going on over here. What do you think about China? Whose news is correct? You'll get all this stuff on you, and you get off Facebook, and you don't know who you are anymore or who to follow. Am I right? Am I wrong? Am I opinionated? Am I not opinionated? Do I need to be a quiet Christian, a humble Christian? Do I need to be an outspoken Christian? Who do I vote for? What's going on? The only place restoration to the original and innocence comes is in the presence of God. So put your phone down, turn the TV off. And sit with your Bible and let the Spirit of God minister to you and tell you who you are. And the more that we do that, we will be able to be original and innocent and go out and remind the world who they are. I watched a couple of videos by Rabbi Zacharias this week on um, how he dealt with the question of homosexuality. It was one of his latest videos before he passed away. It was a 12-minute video. What's your opinion on homosexuality in the church and all this? And he didn't give an answer that I expected. I expected him to just come out and be black and white. Say, this is what the Bible teaches. Well, he didn't do that. He said, basically, from which perspective and culture are you asking that question? Because if in your culture there are no absolutes and you're asking for my definition, I could give you my definition and my absolute, but you'll take it into your world of subjectivism 
and there'll be no absolute. So what does it matter that I answer you at all? So he got off the subject of homosexuality, and he actually said, here is the question at heart. People need to realize they are the temples of the living God. And your ambition in life should not be to figure out if homosexuality is wrong or right. Realize you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and your goal should be to get filled with God himself. And Rabbi Zechariah said, once you get filled with him, let him tell you what to do with your body. And the goal is that when you do have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will tell you this is wrong. Your body was made for this. You are a man. You are a female. But until you have the Holy Spirit, you can't discern between right and wrong. And this, this is what we need today is a restoration to the original. All the arguing, all the debating, all the back and forth is not going to do it. We've got to remind people, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. God wants to dwell inside of you. What do you think about this? And Am I welcome in your church and this and that? God wants to live inside of you. You want to welcome him right now? Are you open? Do you want to receive Jesus? He says he'll pour his spirit out on you. And then they receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will give them discernment and convict them. Oh, wow, I've been confused since I was a little kid about my gender. This is happening in the upper room in Texas, in the heart of town where all the gay and homosexual and lesbian stuff is. They have their church right there, and they have these people walk into their church as they're worshiping, and they're like, what's going on here? What do we do? And the pastor just tells them, stay in the back and let God love on you and break you down. And they're seeing people come out and get saved and realize their gender and realize their identity. And it's all just through love and the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's no, you're wrong, you're sick, you're, this is the Bible, this is right. You know, I, I see people going out on the streets and preaching that way, it doesn't work. Weeks ago, we were out in front of our house and we heard some very loud preaching coming from Kleiner. And I was like, oh, cool, someone's preaching the Word of God. And we started walking over there. And the closer I got, I could feel the spirit of what was being preached. This guy was talking bad about our country. This guy was talking bad about how people are dealing in politics and culture and all the people that don't agree with the right, all the people that don't agree with Christian principles. He was just, just loudly calling people out in their sin, rebuking people. And there was such a cold, hard presence on everybody in their chairs. Nobody was moving. Nobody was celebrating. Nobody. I couldn't feel the presence of the Lord in that place. And I thought, you know what? The culture in the book of Acts was actually worse than it is now. And they came out of the upper room with joy. So much joy that the culture thought they were drunk. And they said, what are you guys drinking over here? <laughs> and 3,000 people got saved by the spirit of joy. Amen. Okay? It's not our job to condemn people. It's just not. Jesus doesn't say go out and condemn people. Jesus says sympathize and be with people where they're at. Love the weaker believer. Go out and preach the gospel. And get them to the place where they realize the Holy Spirit's for them. And the Holy Spirit will convict them and condemn, not, not condemn them. <laughs> convict them to a place of originality and innocence again. But we get in his presence and we find out he awakens us. He reinvigorates us. He electrocutes us literally with his love and power. Literally, there's electricity. There is electricity in the presence of God. Guys, I'm not joking. There is electricity. I've dealt with power. I've been electrocuted before. And it's a real thing. Electricity was put into the earth by who? Who do you think put it there? There's enough electricity in the natural order that God put in nature by one word or one syllable. Long time ago, he created the world, and he put enough power in the earth to generate electricity for the rest of time until he comes back. And when you get in your prayer closet, you get with this God whom electricity comes from, and you realize, wow, I'm dealing with a consuming fire. I'm dealing with power. I'm dealing with electricity. And oftentimes, it's through his love and a revelation of how much he loves you that you'll start trembling, yeah. trembling. A realization of his love. That's what does it. It's a realization of his love. I remember one time we were driving, driving back from McCall, listening to some music, and all of a sudden, Laura's over here in the passenger seat. We, we were listening to some worship, and she's like, I'm like, are you okay? We need, like, do we need to go to the hospital or something? She's like, I don't know what's happening. This is not funny. S Zach, oh my gosh, I can't stop shaking. I'm fe I feel something. It's, you know, and I didn't have the seat heater on. I didn't have the seat vibrate on. She was shaking just for, I think, 10 or 15 minutes under the power and the electricity of God. It's a tangible thing. 
And you might say, well, why do we need that? Why do we need the feelings? Because God is a God of encounter, and he knows through encounter, he can change your perspective. You know, some of us have experiences we can't make sense of, but they affect our lives and empower us to be better people. I don't have understanding and words to put to all my experiences in the Lord, and if I shared them with you, some of you guys would think, okay, that's out there. But it happened, and it strengthened me for a month to resist a certain sin or something like that, or to worship or press into Him more. So don't try to analyze it all in your mind. Come into the presence of God and let Him restore your soul. And here's the thing. The, the, the psalm says, He restores my soul. It's not your mind. Yes, your mind gets captivated. Yes, your mind gets renewed. There's a place for that. But first and foremost, at the root of you is your soul. God has to get past your mental stuff to restore you to your original. You, you, he has to get to the core. He has to get to the heart. The second thing in this verse that says he opens before me the pathways to God's pleasure and leads me along in his footsteps of righteousness. This middle part, he opens before me pathways to pleasure. He gives me pleasure in righteousness. He gives me pleasure in righteousness. In righteousness there's pleasure. In righteousness there's pleasure. I don't know what things you guys like or distract you or take your attention, but sometimes for me it's cars. Sometimes Jude and I will be out and about and we'll look for cars and we'll just be like, whoa, did you hear that engine? Or did you see that paint color? Or, you know? And Laura and I had our date night last night and we're going to dinner and I see this Lamborghini. And I'm like, you don't see those often in this town, okay? So I'm just kind of checking out the car. I didn't even care if the owner was looking out from dinner watching me, but I just, I took a peek at this Lamborghini and it captivated me. It captivated me, and for a moment I thought my life would be funner if I had this car. <laughs> if I did have that car, I wouldn't be driving it around sad, I'll tell you that. And then when the guy actually got in it later and pulled away, the sound of the engine made it all the worse. I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounded amazing. <laughs> But I had to shake it off of myself, guys. At dinner, I was thinking about that Lamborghini. And, not, and I was intentionally enjoying my wife, but I was like, whoa. That was an amazingly stunning design. Someone who created that thing. And I had to bring myself back to what I'm preaching today. All my pleasure is found in righteousness. I don't need a Lamborghini to have pleasure. I don't need that to have fun. And you can translate that to whatever you think you need. A Cuban cigar, I'm not saying that's me, it just came to my mind for somebody in here, word of knowledge, one of you guys likes Cuban cigars. Just kidding. <laughs> Whatever it is for you, a certain TV show, a certain outfit, I mean, yes, you can have these things if you're pure in heart and if you're fully satisfied in Him. There's nothing wrong with that. Laura and I prayed for a long time about whether or not to buy four-wheelers. I felt bad, I'm like, I want some four-wheelers, I've wanted them since I was a kid, but I feel bad, like, as a Christian, do I have the right to go have fun on those and like just go out for the purpose of doing nothing other than going fast and going off jumps and riding on edges of cliffs and just coming back and saying, what did I accomplish to help the world? I like had to struggle in prayer for this thing. And like, God, do I have permission? And it finally took my wife to say, listen, go get them and enjoy the Lord on those things when you go out into the wilderness. And, you know, it was a battle, but I'm just saying as Christians, when you realize all your pleasure truly does come from his presence, He'll give you the discernment about what you should go enjoy from that place if He Himself is the foundation of what you're enjoying. You know what I mean? And sometimes people get the wrong idea about church people in church because we look at the word righteousness and we think living right is a boring, restricted life. A boring, restricted life. I was at the skate park the other day with Judah, and the language that I'm hearing among kids today is crazier than it was in my day. Kids are talking about the most profane, explicit stuff loudly, no matter who's around. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, these kids think that by running their mouths, they're experiencing joy in their freedom, in their individuality. But really, Judah and I over here are restricting our language, speaking only things that are edifying and correcting and used to build up and encourage people. And we actually have the true joy of righteousness. Righteousness gives you true joy. 
It gives you true joy, but some people think Christianity is restrictive and controlling and limiting. It's all about can'ts and don'ts. But that's their perspective because it's skewed by religion and not relationship. And this is what, this is what religious spirits do. They captivate people and they make them think that church and Christianity is a bad place because it restricts you and tells you all the stuff you can't do. So they go and find their joy and their freedom everywhere else. And really, if the presence of God is in our church, and he's happy, and righteousness is the place to find pleasure and joy, then we ought to be so excited and euphoric how we come out of this place that the world says, okay, what's going on at that party? That's how it was when I was in high school. Who had the best party? What's going on over at so-and-so's house? Who's got the food? Who's got the movie going on? Who's got a bigger screen? Who's got a funner backyard? And Chris over here has got a pool table and a foosball table. That's where the party's at. And the church, by recognizing the value of righteousness and holiness and purity, will begin enjoying the Lord, experiencing the pleasure of His presence, so much so that there will be an ecstatic excitement on the church and other people will want to come. Yeah. Right now, the church is hiding. The church is scared and hiding and playing like sheep, like lambs, and going online and doing stuff from YouTube. And I get it. I understand it. But really, it's the world seeing, okay, the church is doing what everybody else is doing. Now's the time for God to inhabit the praises of his people because the enemy is coming against corporate worship and collective gatherings because that's where there's power. He's trying to stifle people's voice in their mouths. He's trying to keep us from coming together and we come together and we praise and we press in and we live righteously and there's joy and there's excitement that comes from us and then we're attractive to the world because we have Jesus all over us. This, this, this phrase should rock your world and blow your mind every time you hear it considering joy. And, and pleasure. Hebrews 12, 2. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. How does Jesus give his life to be crucified? Because he was more overcome by the joy of redemption than he was about the suffering. So in the kingdom of God, if you're, sub, if you're subdued by a power other than God and being held down and your joy is being snuffed out, then you are contributing and believing in that reality more than you are in the reality of joy. Does that make sense? When you're overcome by the reality of heavenly principles, joy follows you. Joy is a part of your life. See, the world is confused. It thinks fun is having what you want, when you want, and how you want it. And that's how you experience joy. How strong of a lie that is. How strong of a lie that is. You guys could have... If you guys don't get another thing in the rest of your lives and you just have what you have now, you can be fully satisfied in the Lord. You don't need a better car. You don't need a bigger house. You don't need different clothes. You can have what you have now and be totally filled in Him, totally satisfied. But in this verse, we see it in Jesus. How do you experience joy? Pure joy comes from suffering for Jesus and suffering with Him. It's called righteousness. Righteousness is when you suffer not doing the wrong thing and you do the right thing. That's righteousness. It's oftentimes harder to do the right thing. And God says his joy is placed on those people who suffer restricting themselves from the wrong thing in order to be found worthy and joyful and righteous. Here's what I mean. As your soul continually becomes awakened through your relationship with God, it brings conflict. Listen to this. As your soul becomes awakened through your relationship with God, it brings conflict by putting pressure on your flesh and everything carnal in your life. Then by learning to prioritize your soul over your flesh, you begin suffering for righteousness' sake. So for the rest of your life, as the Holy Spirit invokes purity in you and reminds you of who you are, you daily become stronger in denying that which is carnal and affirming that which is spiritual. So the closer God gets to an individual and comes upon an individual, there's conflict that arises. It's called suffering for righteousness. It's like, oh my gosh, this isn't right anymore. And then you realize, I don't have the power to stop doing this. And there's a conflict, and there's suffering. And you're like, oh my gosh, I want this right now. And you resist, and you realize you're 100% dependent upon the Spirit of God to deliver you from all unrighteousness and all wickedness. And then you find out, man, this is where true joy is found. This is where true pleasure is found. It's in walking right with God and being right with Him. Here's another hard-hitting verse, James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it pure joy, 
my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. I thank God for the challenges in our culture right now because this is what it's going to do to Christians. It's going to help them be steadfast and perfect in their faith. The Christians who are not pursuing God are going to go along with it and become what the world is. The Christians who are pursuing God and humbly depending on Him every day and crying out for Him and realizing I can't do this on my own are going to continually be perfected by what's going on and be strengthened. This is a significant thing to learn as a Christian. That the pleasurable life is one that's dead to self and crucified with Christ. And the focus shifts from self to Jesus. And your joy comes from following Him. How many of you guys have found yourself not thinking about yourself and you got happier? You looked in the mirror a little less. You were concerned about your feelings just a little less. And at the end of the day, you were really happy and your wife or your husband was like, why are you so happy? I forgot about myself today. That's why. And the more we're consumed with Jesus, the more pleasure we have. Because I can't satisfy myself. Only Jesus can. Oh, how honest should I be with you guys? How safe of a church is this? I don't know. We'll find out. I don't know if I'll get, I don't know if I'll get to that level of honesty yet. All right, let's talk about it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Check this out in Matthew 5. He describes those who are happy. I, and, and I read through the Beatitudes, and these are the, the characteristics that describe those who are happy. Spiritually poor, mourning, those who mourn, those who are humble, those who are merciful, those who are pure in heart, and those for, who work for peace. I didn't hear Lamborghini in there. I heard all this broken stuff. These people who suffer, these people who strive to do the right thing, these people who mourn, you know? It's a time to mourn for our nation in our prayer closet and cry out, say, God, forgive us, help us figure this, help us navigate this. Consume our leaders with your spirit to do the right thing and to lead our country. And, and then come out of that mourning empowered with joy. Don't stay in your mourning, okay? Don't stay in your mourning. Come out of it with joy. And then we circle back around. Now, if living righteously in the presence of God is where joy and pleasure is found, how should the church and church people look to the world? How should we look to the world? For me, the most evocative and thrilling excitement on earth today has come from my experiences in church. If the church is functioning as she's supposed to function, the most euphoria and excitement should be in our gatherings. It should be. It really should be. The disciples in the upper room were not drinking. They had the Holy Spirit, and that was it. And they had the excitement the world needed. Okay? This is why drug addiction is so strong. Here's what the enemy does. Check this out. This is why drug addiction is so strong, because you were made to get high. You were. God formed in you a capacity to climax and get high and experience euphoria. So the enemy comes in. He offers something that will give you that climax, give you that high, but what you don't know is it can't satisfy that innate desire to get high because it's at your soul level, and substances and drugs can never meet your soul level. It ministers to your body. It gives your body a high. It gives your mind a high. It gives your body a euphoria. And then you experience that high, you get addicted to it, and the enemy knows if you continue to be bound up in the substances on the earth that gets you high, your climax will only go as far as the natural. You'll only experience an earthly limitation of that high until you get with Jesus and you find the one that navigates right to your soul and elevates your soul and you experience a high in him that goes right past the earth limitations and excels and goes into heaven. You know what I mean? How many of you guys have had moments with God that you felt a euphoria that nothing else on this earth could give you? Nothing. Nothing. I love the Todd White story when he received Jesus. You know, he was getting shot at. And the bullets just didn't hit him. And he heard a voice say, I just took those bullets for you. Are you ready to serve me now? And he said, yes. You know, he, he, he experiences this God and goes home and gets all his pornography, all his marijuana, 
all his bongs, and he trashes them. Doesn't just trash them, he lights them all on fire because he knows those, I've experienced something way better, way better. And we experience the, the goodness of God in our midst. And that's what I think is happening in our church today, guys. There's a restoration of the... The only word I can think of it right now is party. You know, in heaven it says there's a cloud of witnesses cheering us on. on. I see them celebrating. Come on, come on. And the church, the more we get captivated by Jesus, the more we'll be elevated by His presence and we will experience that ecstatic joy that the world needs to get converted and see Him. It's amazing. The last thing is at the bottom of this, we experience righteousness so that we can bring honor to His name. The purpose of pleasure in righteousness is to glorify Him. It's to bring honor to His name. And I pray that we as a church would get excited about doing the right thing. That we'd be so excited to do the right thing. I'm so excited not to be watching that show anymore. I'm so excited to not be getting satisfied on that news anymore. If you're watching those drama stories on Dateline, Dateline on Friday nights about the murders and the mysteries, I'm telling you, be careful. Is your flesh getting satisfied with those stories or is your soul getting satisfied with those stories? Whatever it is, you, only you know what you're going to to get satisfied. And if it's for your flesh, it will not contribute to righteousness where there's pleasure. You'll have to go back to that thing to get satisfied again. And it won't ever touch the core of who you are and fully satisfy you. It's just like in a marriage. You... The, the man takes, excuse me, the, the woman takes the last name of the man. And in your covenant with Jesus, you come to Jesus and you take on his name. It's no longer Zach Arnstam, it's Zach Jesus Christ. That's the name I honor now. It's, it's, I don't live to preserve my name. It's not about me anymore. And what we're seeing in this psalm is that this pleasure in righteousness, this living for God, gives honor to his name and it's all about Jesus. I ask you today to... Look at your life and ask the Lord to show you what in your life is contributing to the glory of His name. His glory. It's all about Him. Everything we have is for Him. Every material possession we have is for Him. Every gift and talent we have is for Him. If you're in business, if you, you know, in your place of work, in the abilities he've, He's given you, I challenge you, put all that on the throne and say, Lord, this really doesn't belong to me. It's not mine. It's for you. How do you want to be glorified in my life? How do you want to use me in my life? I like what Charles Finney says. He says, Everyone has been given the great responsibility to win as many souls as possible to Christ. What is life's purpose? What is, what is life's goal? Some people might say to enjoy God. Yes, it is to enjoy God. I like what Charles Finney says, though. Your life's purpose is to bring as many people to Christ as possible. And I, th I think he's right. I think when we get to that day before the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to be like, dang, I could have brought more people with me. As you're getting ready to enter into heaven and you see the glory and the wonder of heaven, you're going to wish you brought more people there to enjoy it. When something good is happening, you want to share it with others, right? When something good's going on, you want to share it. You come across a new food or a new snack, you want to go to your family and kids be like, dude, try these pretzels. These are crazy. I got them at the gas station over here. They're called Dots, all right? Or Dotties, one of the two. Stay away from those pretzels. <laughs> Have you had those? Yeah. Yeah. They're a very dangerous snack. I almost died eating those the other day. It was after a fast. When something's good... You want to share it. And when we get to heaven, you guys, we're going to realize it's, this thing's going to be opened up before us and be like, I should, have, I should have tried to take more people. And I think Charles Finney is right. Let everything about your life be used to bring people along into this, to bring people into this. Thank God that you're already in the household of God. You're already a member of the family. And it's not going to change. You're going to be a member of the family. But I pray that everything we have, our profession, our money, our time, our influence, our talents, our attention, will be used to exalt Him and make Him known. It'll be all, all about Jesus. And then it'll be all about Him. You guys doing all right? Yep. Anybody 
discouraged in here? Because I'll preach through this again, if you are. So I just thank you, God, for this word, this psalm. It reminds us that there is pleasure in following you and doing what you tell us to do. In you, you restore the original, you restore our soul. You bring us back to innocence again. You bring us back to the beauty and the glory of who you made us to be. I pray that all of us would be so convicted about who we are in here that we wouldn't have to put stuff on out there and try to figure it out, that we would just be bare and naked before you and not ashamed of who we are. We're children of the light. We're sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are brought into this family and we're proud of it. And we don't have to be ashamed or, or be anything else and we don't have to act like we have other things together. We can just be children of God and be confident in that one thing because it is what the world needs to see, the genuineness of our faith on the earth. pray for the power of this psalm and these principles to permeate our soul and to transform us and strengthen us this week, Lord. Mercy, will you and your mom come up here and wait on the Lord with me and pray? Before we close. Bless you today. Bless you today, Lord. Do something in this church, Lord, that is completely unconventional, but in line with your word and your spirit. I pray for the ecstatic praises of Yahweh to go forth from this house in such mighty power that all things get shaken, principalities, demons, powers of darkness, that there would be a shaking that takes place from this place, and an authenticity of the fire of the Holy Spirit burning in your people. We need you, Lord. I need you just in my marriage and in my family and parenting. Just in that arena, before I even go out in the world, we need you. We humbly depend on you. I give you all the glory today. I thank you for every person here today. Thank you for taking care of us, Lord. Thank you for sharing your word with us. Thank you for sharing your secrets and your mysteries with us. Jesus says, I don't call you for, uh, servants anymore. I call you friends because the master's business is made plain and open to you now. I thank you for the access, Lord. Mercy, I just want to give you and your mom the microphone. If you do as the Spirit leads you, if you, want to, if you or your mom wants to sing us a song in your language or pray, then you guys feel free to, to close us in that way, all right? Mana Huru, Mana Kizerwa, Mana Quiringirwa, 
Oh, hallelujah. Che wo gufi chane miti mayachu. Tura gushim ya tura guhimba hache kukubiri nzi bugawe mana. Wajize neza. Oh, ite kamana yo mwijuru. Oturi indira muri iki gihugu turi indana na bene data ndagushimye ndaguhimbaje icyubahiro ni kibi cyawe kubwo umwuka waduhaye duhumeka uwiteka mana yo mwijuru utwishyuje nti twabona icyo twishyura umunsi kuwundi ariko ndagushimye kuko uri imana igira neza ndagushimye kuko waturinze ukaturindana n'imiryango yacu komeza nubundi turinde tuzongere guhura ku cyumweru gitaha duhume ku mukabazima nta gikuba cyacitse muri twe uwiteka mwami imana nyiringabo nkuragije imiryango yose iri hano uwiteka reka uru rugo ruho mugisha reka uwiteka ukomeza ubigaragarize kuko uri imana urakoze icyubahiro kibicya mu izina rya Yesu amen Ye kuri rimba kare rimbo gato kavuga ngo imirimo y'amaboko y'Imana imirimo y'amaboko yawe Imana irahebuje Mu mano uri nkuru imirimo yawe irahebuje The works of God is so great Alright Uri nkuru mana uri nkuru uri nkuru mana uri nkuru The song says that, oh God, you so great. The works of your hand is so great. Uh, you never change. A person can change, but you, you never change. Hallelujah. Thank you. I pray we all receive that. The Lord's singing over his people. The Lord's saying, I delight in you guys. I'm proud of you guys. You got this. I pray that every one of you would walk in the gifts and the calling that you've received and not shrink back and not turn back in any way, but that you'd be filled to the fullness of overflowing joy every part of your week, every part of your day. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Love you guys. Yeah, no.